Hey, I'm Phoebe. I'm Dogstar some places online, and I'm Ratsgod on Twitter, which is Dogstar backwards. This is my APL talk. So I am I don't program an APL professionally. I'm not like a representative from dialogue or anything. I just started working with it because it was unlike any other programming language I had ever used or had even ever seen. And I ended up finding it very fun and very interesting. So I've stuck with it for a while. Um, it is also kind of notoriously, unbelievably intimidating the first time you look at it. Um, so hopefully this talk will make it a little more appealing, uh, give you a little insight into how it's actually working, and maybe you will understand why I find it so fun. Uh, some background. So what you might know about this, uh, APL is a programming language, if it wasn't clear. Um, it's very terse. You can get like whole useful programs complete in it um, in just a few lines or even just a few characters. Uh, it's quite old um, for, as far as programming languages go. It's based on a notation that was invented in the 1950s um, and was then implemented as a language in the early to mid 60s, depending on what you think the first implementation was. And it's also pretty notorious for having a lot of symbols that are not used anywhere else. This is an old APL keyboard that you would have used to enter the symbols in. Um, if you look at the Unicode for the <laughs> APL symbols, they are labeled as APL symbols. They, are, they didn't exist before. They aren't used for anything else anywhere else. They're APL. Um, so what you might not know is it's literally a programming language. That's what APL stands for, a programming language. Um, and the syntax was originally supposed to be an alternative mathematical notation invented by the Canadian uh, mathematician Kenneth Iverson. Um, it was supposed to make all the existing mathematical notations that were out in the world a lot more consistent, a lot more easy to understand. Um, and then it just ended up becoming a programming language because people liked it, kind of similar to the story behind Lisp. Um, it has surprisingly modern features. Uh, I won't have time to cover them, but you will probably be surprised. There's stuff like currying, higher order functions. Um, uh, I don't know, I got a slide on it. Um, it's still used. It's most like prominently used in the banking and like financial industries. Like a lot of big banks tie everything together with APL, but it's around in a bunch of different industries. If you're curious about it, you can go to like Dialog's website and see you know, some case studies. Um, a lot of people really like it. A lot of people find it really interesting. Um, there's chat rooms. You can go and find all sorts of enthusiasts who are just trying to figure out more and more beautiful ways to write some algorithm or another. And apparently its influence is felt in like uh, a lot of numerical programming languages like R and NumPy. I haven't used those, but some people I talk to are just like, oh, this is just like an R. So, hey, if you use those, let me know. Talk to me about it. Um, so there's a bunch of implementations. There's a lot of old implementations that have like come and gone because it's been around for 60, 70 years. Um, uh, the one I'm going to focus on is Dialog. My pointer's on the screen. The one I'm going to focus on is Dialog because it's a proprietary implementation, but it's the most cutting edge one. It's where all the new features come from. Uh, it's got a great community. It's, it's fun. It's easy. It works on any given operating system. Uh, if you're looking for an open source one, there's GNU and NGN APL. I would recommend NGN APL because when I tried both of them, NGN felt a little more modern. So I'm going to give you a quick demo. Here is an algorithm that will list the first 100 or all of the numbers that all of the prime numbers below 100. Um, so you might see what I mean by it is intimidating. All right, this is dialogue. At the top, those are all of the symbols in APL. So hey, there's not so many of them. Easy to memorize. So this is um, the algorithm I just showed you, except that's the first 10 numbers. Here's the first symbol I'm going to teach you about APL. That's lamp. And what that is, that denotes that the rest of the line is a comment because it illuminates code. It's a lamp. Um, so the first bit of syntax I'm going to tell you is monadic and dyadic functions. Those are pretty technical terms. If you are familiar with like monads from Haskell or something, this is like completely different. It's far simpler. Um, so get it out of your head. Uh, so this is, symbol means divide, and this is the monadic application of divide. And all monadic means is that it takes one argument. And when it takes one argument, that will be the value on the right of the symbol. So divide five in the monadic form is just the inverse of five, 0 0.2. So the dyadic just means it takes two variables. Um, uh, first of all, when it's monadic, the value will always be on the right side. Dyadic, it'll be on the left and the right side. So here divide is five divided by four, 1.25. So basically, all of those symbols will have monadic and dyadic behavior. And they will be different, but they will be related. Um, those symbols are actually pretty mnemonic when you get used to them. And it helps that 
you know, the two different functions will have something in common with each other conceptually. Um, here's another function. Uh, in, it's called the index generator. This is IOTA. Um, and so when you use it monadically on 10, for example, it generates all the numbers one through 10. This is called the index generator because it corresponds to all the indices of an array of length 10. What you might intuit from this is that APL is one indexed, um, but you can change that if you want. It can be one or zero index, depending on what you want, um, which, hey, that's fun when you recode. Um, here's another function, it's drop. Here it is in the dyadic form. So you see the down arrow uh, when it has two values, the one on the left means drop that many elements from the thing on the right. The thing on the right just being iota 10, one through 10, like we had before. Um, so you see, we dropped the first element of it. You might be wondering about how precedence works now that we have a bunch of different things going on. Uh, for each symbol, basically each symbol takes the whole thing to the right side of it as the expression. Uh, as its right-handed input. Um, it's called the long right scope. You can imagine after each symbol, there's basically an open right parentheses that gets closed at the end of the line. So you end up, as a consequence of, of this, you end up reading uh, APL expressions from right to left, which is kind of neat. Um, so uh, there's anonymous functions or functions or lambdas or defunds as APL calls them. This syntax is called defunds. Um, so here's a function. Um, it takes one argument. Uh, it's a monadic function. Um, so the symbol you use for the argument to a monadic function is omega. Um, so this is a function that takes a number to, um, uh, adds one to it, and then returns it. Uh, the plus is addition, uh, by the way. Um, three. Uh, so here's, we are doing, we are creating a dyadic function now here. Um, when you're creating a dyadic function, the symbol for the left value is alpha. So we have a function alpha minus omega. This is it makes 10 minus five, it's five. So another bit, multiplication. Uh, the symbol for multiplication in APL is a little X, kind of like if you went to a grade school that was like mine, um, you might remember that. And that is because the star that you might use for multiplication in other languages is used for exponentiation in APL. Two to the power of three is eight. So one more function before we get into something more exciting is concatenating two arrays. So these, even though it's just one and two, those are both arrays. They are arrays of zero dimensions. Wow. Um, but <laughs> you can concatenate them anyway into a single array. Um, and so we have two more normal arrays here that we also concatenate into a single array. All right, so another um, bit of syntax and the most complicated thing yet is the outer product. The outer product is denoted by this circle this dot and then your function. This is the comma function, just like we used above that concatenates two arrays. So the outer product, if you know the idea of the Cartesian product, this is that. If you're not, basically think about it as this is taking all of the combinations of these, of pairs of these two arrays, like selecting one from each of them, all the different possible combinations and applying that function in the middle to all of them and arranging the result in a matrix. Maybe that makes more sense when you see it visually. It's kind of hard to explain verbally. But you can see it took one, two, three. For each one, two, three, matched it up with each four, five, six in a row, returned all of them. There's nine values. We can get rid of the parentheses because of how precedence works. So starting to put things together, um, we have our function here that uh, it's a monadic function, takes one, two, five on the right, um, then just takes that value and applies it to both sides of the outer product of join like we had. So one through five, like that, creates a lot of values. So here we are creating a times table of all the numbers from two through 10. This is just one, drop, dropping one from the numbers one through 10, two through 10, then creating a times table because we're doing the outer product, all the combinations of all the numbers two through 10. So one thing we should take a quick note on because we are trying to create a prime number algorithm here is that this times table incidentally contains all of the composite numbers less than 10. They're in there somewhere. None of the prime numbers are. Let's keep that in mind. <laughs> um, so to get into some of how logic works in APL, I'll go over a few like logical operators. Um, so if you have something like an array of all the numbers one through 10, and then you come make an expression like five is less than the array of numbers one through 10, it returns a uh, Boolean array where it's zero for all of the instances where that was not true, one for all of the instances where it was true. Um, and then you have a tilde, the monadic tilde just means not. So we get the inverse of that. So this is a simplification of the slash because the slash is like a million things in APL, but right now it is doing this. <laughs> um, it, it, 
so we are selecting this takes two arrays of the same length um and the left denotes what to take from the array on the right so wherever there's a one you take that element wherever there's a zero you do not take that element so in this case one zero one will take one and three from that array um here's another function uh epsilon when used in the dyadic form will go through the array on its left check the membership of and check to see if it's in the array on the right one zero one because one and three were in there and two was not so let's start to all of the that huge pile of information i just gave you let's try and put it together here so we have a dyadic function um we see we have the value one through ten on the right two three four on the left and you can see that we are selecting from the value on the right we're selecting from one through ten the elements in one through ten that are not because of the tilde in because of the epsilon alpha the value on the right so all the we're selecting all the elements from one through ten that are not in two three four and we get it um quickly the notation for assignment is the left arrow so we're calling to z um and we do we get z back whenever we sorry we get two back whenever we use z um you can do this in line just to make things even terser so this statement will make z equal to three then add one to it it returns four but we can see z is three um let's start putting it all together so we can actually generate some prime numbers um so z will be the numbers two through ten um here we generate the times table uh all the number all the products of all the combinations of the numbers two through ten um and we are selecting from z z is over here um all of the numbers in z that are not in the times table that we generated so two through seven those are the prime numbers we can put it all on one line we can start to make things a little terser um and it actually works and if we make it run on 100 it still works um and there's other ways you can write this if you found the way i used assignment in that previous input ugly you can nest defunds you can just create this tower of anonymous functions if that is more to your aesthetic sensibilities there are other ways to do this. They're much better. Um, there are faster ways to do this. This is not a fast algorithm. There are prettier ways to do this. This is not really a pretty algorithm, um, unless you think it is. If you think it is, it is. Um, OK. Um, there's a lot of features in this language that we didn't really talk about. Um, we don't have the time to talk about them, but look quickly. <laughs> um, there's a lot of related languages. There, APL has two child languages, or the two most prominent child languages of APL, I should say, are J and K. J has, <laughs> J has more, sim there's also a child A. Uh, there's more symbols in, in J. There's a focus on numerical programming, uh, implementing numerical algorithms, and a focus on tacit programming. And what tacit programming is, is uh, when you create entire computer programs just uh, without, just purely out of function composition. Like if you know point free in Haskell, like that, like J is a point free language, you can write inline functions kind of like what we did in apl but it is a baffling syntax um k no offense to j i love j uh, <laughs> i say that because i love it um k has even fewer symbols you can think of it as like a reduced set um none of these have one-to-one -one correspondence to apl by the way so k has fewer symbols it's designed for efficiency and designed for more general purpose out in the world's programming and both of these uh only use ASCII characters, only characters that someone could type if they had like the keyboard like I have on this laptop, which kind of gets rid of the problem where people were intimidated by the strange characters in APL. Um, K has recently added some weird symbols back in. It's fun. Um, so let's talk about some psychology of uh, APL. Like, why is this actually interesting? Um, it works really well in a REPL. This is one of the first things I noticed. Like a lot of languages claim to be good in a REPL or be at home in a REPL, like Lisp particularly, but nothing felt quite like how APL feels in a REPL, which is you can sit down and like never open a text editor and sit like just write a complete non-trivial program all in like one line and just like keep going back and editing little bits. And it's very satisfying, I found, to work like this. Um, Kenneth Iverson, the person who created the uh, notation in the first place wrote this uh, paper and gave a lecture notation as a tool of thought um and it's the idea that we know programming languages are languages we tend to view them as languages to communicate between humans and computers but they're also to communicate with other humans they're also to uh communicate with yourself in the future or yourself in the present um and you know do other things like it should be good at those things but also preferably will be good at doing things like formally verifying your programs or proving like 
commutivity or transitivity of various functions that you write. And it's pretty utopian, but APL tries to be good at all of these things. Another interesting thing, um, or a specific instance of the previous thing, um, there's an APL programmer named Aaron Sue. Uh, I find him very interesting. His writing and talks are great. Um, here's an example of what his text editor looks like while he's writing APL, which might look quite baffling. Um, but the idea is that by having all of these different iterations of like this algorithm he's writing, all of the screen on the same time, he doesn't have to jump to different points in the code base. He doesn't even have to scroll. They're just there. The idea is that this will like really rapidly increase flow in a way that like other languages that don't have the benefit of this torsionness like couldn't really. Like he can see all of the iterations. He can like pretty instinctively see all of the different ways that it has evolved over time, what worked, what didn't. It's all on his screen and it all remains in his head. Um, it's a cool article. That's his blog there. Um, okay, uh, I'm done. <laughs> I probably went over time. But uh, if you want to try APL, there's tryapl.org. This is an in-browser REPL. It has buttons you can click that will insert the characters, so you don't have to learn how to type them yet. But they are easier to type in dialogue. There's ways to do it. Things are nice. Um, and there's also a chat room, the APL Orchard, the Apple Orchard. Um, it's on Stack Exchange, which I did not know had chat rooms until I discovered this room, but it's super nice. There's people there who just hang out and deeply love APL and deeply love helping people learn APL. So go check it out. Okay. I'm done.